Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Sean Orien. He's my friend, colleague, Irish diplomat, experienced linguist and polyglot, currently uh, posted as a deputy ambassador of Ireland to Austria and to the international institutions in Vienna. And he is experienced diplomat. Uh, he was posted in six countries. And uh, he is the president of the European Esperanto Association Union in, uh, since 2002. And uh, he is the uh, vice president of the European uh, Civil Society Platform for Multilingualism uh, since 2009, when it was established by the European Commission, uh, composed of uh, 29 NGOs. And he will uh, present us a very important and actual uh, topic, Brexit and languages in Europe. On Brexit uh, has been uh, said, uh, many uh, discussions, many debates is, are going uh, around, and, but on languages it is not so. And I would like to give him a floor, and he will uh, present you an interesting topic. Karage Mikoy, dear friends, thank you very much. I'm very touched and very happy to see you turning out in such uh, good numbers. And thank you, Joseph, for the introduction. Um, my topic is um, Brexit and EU languages. I won't speak on Brexit generally, but on the possible linguistic consequences. But to begin with, I would like to mention that, uh, that you know some of my background being, being Irish. Um, I, I grew up in a, a milieu in Ireland which was very enthusiastic about the Irish language. And uh, our enthusiasm for Irish can be sometimes misunderstood as being against English. But I always wanted to, to emphasize that we're not against English as such, but against the domination of any one language. I often, the um, image I often like to mention is a, a red rose. It's a very beautiful flower, a red rose, and most of us like red roses. But how many of us would like to have a garden full of red roses, which has no other flower in it? I think that that, that is the, the, the uh, important difference that the it's not a, it's something against English, it's against the domination of any one national language, whether it be English, French, German, Chinese. Um, it's in favor of diversity, in favor of, of uh, variety. I think that that's, that, that's extremely important, uh, an important point. But first of all, just to give you an idea of what the, the Irish language is, many people who have not heard Irish will assume that it's uh, some kind of dialect of English, that it sounds like English. It's, it's in, very, very different indeed, and I would like to just very briefly, I'm not a good singer, but I would like to sing a song, which gives us some idea of what it sounds like, and to, a short poem as well, just so, so that you get the feel for this language and how very different uh, from, from English or from many uh, first neighboring languages, it's closer to Welsh as a Celtic language than, than it is to, to English. First of all, a little poem about St. Patrick. Ceisteg Padrig, Gran Ngoel, La erlech le ilt, Kilt macronan the scale, tra in erin, eglash. In his doing a scaly veen, Cretog dif shantianus, no creda honishiv, gan va, on irid vair in a firna. Tree trail the gang in ishing, Dragger quilts a kilver, Glania agree, Gosnyat our neag, his bart the rear arm rear. When I worked in the Irish Embassy in Poland, I used to offer a, a million zlotys, which is about 25 euros, a million zloty note to anybody who understood one word of the Irish poem. I never had to give that money away. <laughs> uh, a little song then, it's a song called Eamon O'Chanik. It's a song of, of written over 300 years ago. It, one of my ancestors probably, or at least a relative, because my name is Sean O'Rean, and the writer of this song about 1700 is Eamon O'Rean, called Eamon O'Chanik. 
he basically took the wrong side in the English Civil War when, when England deposed uh, King James II in 1688 as um, not because he was Catholic, but because he had a Catholic son and they didn't want a Catholic uh, um, a succession of Catholic uh, monarchs. Um, there was a battle between King William and King James and most of the, the war, most of the fighting took place in Ireland, in fact, with the Battle of the Boyne and the Battle of Ogrim. But uh, Eamon O'Rean from my part of Ireland, from Tipperary, was on the wrong side. He supported the Catholic King James against the Protestant King William and his side lost, basically. So when he lost, all of his lands were confiscated and he was declared an outlaw. And um, the, in the song, he calls to the house of his girlfriend and she's afraid to open the door. She said that uh, the English are shooting at you and if, if I try to help you, they'll, they'll just shoot both of us. So sorry, you're on your own this time. And she refuses to open the door, so he heads away to the hills, to the mountains, sadly saying that he has no more support in Ireland and that... The only thing he can look forward to now is hopefully getting a, a boat, travel to the continent to, to leave all of the sad Irish history behind him. So it's, a, it's called Eamon O'Chanik, and Eamon O'Chanik literally means Eamon of the Hill, because he spent his time as an outlaw out in the, out in the hills or in, in Tipperary. So the song goes like this. <laughs> I will fear a rago, a reba magarish, hunta, misha eman achnik, a tabaita for flach, a hir yul schleitze, is launta, a leil sachid, kadiam hing shagit, morgerin art bang. The Mahuna Squil Puder got you. Ah, here head a lot is come a mishare Muhta Sfada Mishamo. Fech nachtas fech yuk Skanda nachtagam Erenya Moheshrach Ganskar. Smavraner gan kar is kaniada gam in elchar nil karid a gam is tanid lam san aglakach me moch no denach is kogahi medal arfarigasir o saun of William dem Huelta. Now, just uh, before finally topling, turning to the topic, just one small anecdote. I heard from uh, an English professor, uh, Professor Robert Philipson, who has written many books on English uh, imperialism and, and uh, English-only Europe. Very interesting books, uh, which I would heartily recommend. Um, he worked for many years with the British Council, and, and um, he's English-born, lives in Denmark now. But he told me a, a little story at one stage, which I... Uh, as a hazard of retelling, it was a story he said about an Englishman coming to Ireland for the first time and meeting a young Irishman who was studying the Irish language. And he was kind of puzzled at this and he said, well, why do you spend so much time learning this language? It's, it's uh, not an international language, has no international use, uh, is not even spoken widely in Ireland itself. Why do you spend so much time and so much energy studying this language? And the Irishman said, well, it was the language of all of my ancestors for thousands of years when I die and go to heaven, I want to be able to speak to them. <laughs> and the Englishman said, but if you, leave a, if you lead a bad life and you, you wind up not going to heaven, but going to hell, this would be a problem for you. And the Irishman said, absolutely no problem. I already speak English. <laughs> As I emphasize, I heard this story from an Englishman, from Professor Robert Philipson. But uh, moving to um, Brexit, finally, Brexit and languages, uh, there are lots of misunderstandings about this. For instance, uh, Danuta Hübner, the ex-Polish commissioner um, and uh, member of the European Parliament, uh, 
at the time of the Brexit referendum, uh, last June of last year, 23rd of June, um, she meant, she said that now that uh, if the UK leaves the European Union, uh, uh, English will have to disappear as an official language. I think she knew at the time that this wasn't true, because it, it simply isn't, but it creates a lot of misunderstandings. And I was a bit shocked in Ireland that some people who should know better uh, came out with this idea that now that England or that the United Kingdom leaves, we no longer have English. The actual factual situation is quite different. It's, uh, English is one of the official, it's one of the 24 official working languages. This was so by, uh, uh, on the entry of Ireland and, and Britain back in 1973. That can only be changed by unanimous decision of the Council of Ministers. In other words, all of the ministers, the Irish minister, the Dutch, not the Dutch, the Dutch, the Cypriot minister, the Maltese minister, they would have to unanimously agree that English be removed as one of the languages. There was zero chance of that happening. So English will remain as one of the official languages. This idea that each country only has to have one language, that's simply not true. Again, it's something that's widely believed that each country can only nominate one language and now that Ireland has nominated Irish, we can no longer have English. That's not true. Bilingual countries, the basic um, regime in the European Union is that as countries join, the official languages of each country become official languages of the European Union. Finland has uh, Finnish, Finnish and Swedish, so Swedish was al already a, um, became a, uh, an official language when Sweden joined, but um, Belgium also has two lang official languages. Uh, um, Ireland, from the time we joined, Irish got a certain status. Now, we, we, Ireland voluntarily didn't ask for full uh, status for the Irish language when we joined in 1973. It became what was called a treaty language. In other words, the Treaty of Rome was translated into Irish but it didn't uh, become a working language. Only later on, in, 19, in 2005, there was a campaign in Ireland to seek the same status for Irish as for the other 23, at the time 22 languages, and uh, that was successful and, and granted. And there still is a derogation, because sort of not everything is translated into Irish yet, but it's moving in the direction of having more and more material translated into Irish, and by the 1st of January 2022, the derogation will will have run out, and uh, then Irish will be the same as Slovak or, or Hungarian or, or Slovenian, all the others, the, the same amount of material will be translated into it as into the other languages. But uh, um, just to get rid of, first of all, of the, the, this uh, feeling that, that the English language will in some way disappear or no longer be official in the European Union, uh, th that simply won't happen. What could happen in the long run, uh, and this is interesting that um, the President of the Commission, uh, um, Jean-Claude Juncker, um, a few weeks ago mentioned that he, in Florence, he said he would deliver a speech in French. Now he said because the English language is slowly but surely losing uh, its importance in, in Europe. Um, that may have been wishful thinking or may, may not, but I, I noticed that Juncker on the one hand, he likes to use French and, and German. He, from the time he became President of the Commission, he started to make speeches in the European Parliament mainly in French, with some in German, and using far less English than his predecessors. But on the, at the same time, as was pointed out this morning, he also uh, got rid of multilingualism as one of the uh, competences of European commissioners. For two years, from 2007 to 2009, uh, Leonard Urban, the Romanian commissioner, was commissioner for multilingualism. Then, he, when he was replaced, you had a commissioner for um, culture and education and multilingualism, and the commission which took office at the end of 2014 no longer has multilingualism in the title of, of any commissioner. It's simply a commissioner for education and, and culture, but not multilingualism anymore. So on the one hand, you have a, a president of the commission who is um, inclined to use more French and German than his predecessors, but at the same time, uh, there was a feeling that the Commission has been too, doing too many things that it needs to concentrate on very uh, uh, economic affairs, on very uh, concrete, um, tangible affairs, and therefore it tended to, to, get, uh, to get rid of a lot of, uh, of other policies which it had been doing, which it had been, uh, where it had been active. Uh, this just reminds me back in the early the 90s, 95 to 99, you had the Santerre Commission. Uh, which basically resigned in 1999 because it was about to be fired by the European Parliament because of various scandals which took place. But they had a motto in 1995. The, the Santerre Commission followed the, um, 
a, a very active commission indeed, which had been very, extremely, probably too active in some areas. The South Health Commission had a, a motto of do less, but do it better. Some would say that in the four years that it was in office, it only succeeded in the first half of its motto. It managed to do less. It didn't manage to do it better. Uh, in any case, that's a, a, a side point. Um, what the, um, the Brexit could have as a, poly, uh, um, as a consequence, a possible consequence, would be um, over time there would be less native English speakers in the European institutions, um, more or less those working in the Commission and um, Council Secretariat and European Parliament. They're roughly proportional to the percentage of the population within the European Union, and up to now that has been about 13% for English. The UK and Ireland, um, you've had about 13% of native English speakers. With the UK leaving and only Ireland left, suddenly the percentage of, uh, of native English speakers goes down from 13% to about 1%, because the population of Ireland is only about 1% of the population of the European Union. And as, as the years roll by and there are less and no more recruitment from the UK and only a recruitment from Ireland, you would have less and less native English speakers working in the institutions. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean there'll be less English used, but um, it does make perhaps a qualitative difference in, in, in language. The, uh, at least, uh, hopefully, it will, lead, uh, it will lead to more discussion of language policy in the European Union, because for a long time, language policy has been the elephant in the room, the elephant that everybody pretends not to see. It's uh, seen as so sensitive that um, it could blow up, so people just they talk about everything else, they talk about transport and fisheries and uh, all kinds of other different policies, which are all important in their own way, but the language issue is uh, pushed aside and left for later on or left because uh, people feel it's too divisive and mainly it come from, comes from a mindset of people who are absolutely not conscious of the existence of a language like Esperanto. They don't realise that there is such a thing as a neutral language which could be uh, used, which could be given a role in the European institutions, because they think, they think exclusively in terms of national languages, they say, let's avoid this discussion because the British will want English, the German will want German, the French will want French, and this, you'll have a huge row between the different countries, each wanting their own language, and the Spanish looking for more Spanish, and the Italians looking for more Italian, and, and uh, this will be extremely divisive. And in some areas it can be divisive, where I've been present in Brussels at discussions, for instance, uh, on the Western Balkans, and when the Commission representative distributed a document in English, French and German, in three languages, immediately the Italian colleague sitting beside me protested, because Italy has a policy that they will accept the use of English and French only. But if German is added, Italy insists that Italian should be added too. And they take this policy so far that if something is distributed in German, German, English and French, but not in Italian, then they will walk out of the meeting. They say, I'm leaving this meeting as a protest for the non-use of Italian. Because you used German and you didn't use Italian. And I've seen Italian colleagues walk out of meetings because of this. So it's taken quite seriously. And perhaps because of these kind of incidents that take place from time to time, uh, people consider the whole issue of language policy to be explosive and, and to be very dangerous and better to be pushed aside and say, let's, we'll talk about this tomorrow. As, as they used to say in the film, gone, gone, gone with the wind, I'll think about that tomorrow and we'll put it off uh, mañana, some other time, not, not now, it's too, too dangerous, too, too um, explosive. Uh, the, um, the late Claude Piron, uh, I would say I was privileged to be a friend of his, who died a couple of years ago, he wrote some very interesting books and he was a translator and interpreter with the United Nations for many years and then became a psychologist working at Geneva University. But he wrote some very interesting things about uh, languages and psychology and one of his ideas was that people don't even consider a language like Esperanto because they have this idea that they see language as a kind of a miracle. When, when they're babies, you're born and you have no language and you're, you're hungry or you're cold or something. You just cry and you hope that somebody guesses what's wrong because you have no way of getting across what you want, the fact that you're hungry. 
And then suddenly, after a certain number of months, a baby learns the word hunger or hungry or, and can use this word. And it's magic. As soon as the baby uses the word hungry, food appears. Or either the, the breast is given to be breast food or a bottle of milk or something appears. And the, the baby is convinced this is an absolute miracle all of a sudden because when I was born, nothing worked. And all of a sudden, I have this word and things appear, things happen when I mention a word. And that because of this, because most of us learned our, our first language, our mother tongue, literally with our, with our mother's milk, it, it, lear, it was learned as babies and it was learned as something miraculous. The very idea then of a language which can come out of nowhere, like or can, can be devised by, by an individual and, and used by a community, but it is not the national language, didn't, uh, um, didn't evolve in the way other languages evolved. It seems to be something that it couldn't possibly work, and even if it does work, it shouldn't work. <laughs> People have this, this idea that it's kind of a, there's an automatic rejection of it, and you find this again and again, and the more conservative people are, the more they reject anything like Esperanto. I've, I found that again and again, they would say, Esperanto, no, uh, not, it's not possible, and it just shouldn't possibly work. And, and then when you explain to them that it, it, it's logical and straightforward and it does work, uh, they emotionally they say, yes, maybe it does, but I don't like it, I don't want to hear about this, let's talk about something else. Uh, they, they, they instinctively, emotionally reject uh, this, this idea. So uh, hopefully the, the, the Brexit may, may concentrate more minds on the whole idea of, of language policy. Uh, just to mention in passing that um, uh, the Professor Francois Grand, uh, an economist in, in the University of Geneva, he did a calculation back in 2005 uh, on the, the dominance of the English language internationally and the amount of money that that brings to the, to the UK economy, and I would have to admit to the Irish economy as well. He just calculated that back in 2005 that it brought the international dominance of English about between 17 and 18 billion euros to the UK economy annually and to the Irish economy about 4% about of that. So it's, it's actually uh, more money than North Sea oil and about three times as much money as the famous British uh, budgetary rebate. So it's, you're talking about a huge amount of money, an absolutely huge amount of money. And this is a, an actually a subvention that the poorer countries of Europe pay this amount of money and it goes to one of the richer countries of Europe, the UK, which has now voted to leave the European Union, paradoxically. So it's, it's all very, very, very strange. But again, it's something that's that not, not spoken about uh, uh, enough, I would say. And then people also have this kind of fatalistic idea that the, the use of languages is it's like the weather. It's, it's set. It's, uh, it's snowing again, or it's, uh, the sun is shining. Uh, that's very happy, the sun is shining, or the, we have a snow drift. We just have to accept this. We can do nothing about it. But in, in reality, language policy does nothing inevitable about it. The Latin was dominant for many centuries because of the, the might of the Roman Empire in conquering uh, the whole Mediterranean and, and, and uh, many most of, of Europe. Um, French was dominant again because of the might of France in the time of Louis XIV, uh, three centuries ago. French, France was the dominant power in Europe and all the ruling families of the other countries, uh, such as Russia, Maria Theresia, for instance, the Empress of Austria, she didn't speak Hochdeutsch, she didn't speak standard German, she spoke the Viennese dialect and she spoke French. And she probably spoke French better than any other language, being part of the, of the royal family. In those days, French was the, the dominant language for the royal families. And now English is the dominant language, again, not because of any intrinsic merits of the language, but because of the, the British Empire having about 25% of the, the land area of the world, taking in Canada and Australia and, and uh, South Africa, and a, a huge part of the, of the, of the globe. Um, and plus, add to that, the uh, military and, and political and, and cultural might of the United States, economic might of the United States now, those two, those two factors put together would account for the dominance of, of English, plus the fact that it is initially it is easier to, it's easier to learn English than it is to learn French. You have to learn French irregular verbs, take a lot more time to master the French subjunctive and the other things that um, Tim Morley mentioned this morning. It takes more, longer to, to mention, but I would contend that the, the real reason behind language dominance, it's uh, political and cultural and, and uh, economic and perhaps military to an extent, it's not so much the intrinsic linguistic uh, factors um, involved. Uh, 
uh, moving on to um, something which, uh, when, when I came across Esperanto first and people said, well, if you used uh, French or German, if you use uh, French or German, you are, you are disadvantaged. And I, I, I became quite fluent in French because my wife, wife is French speaking, we use French at home all the time. I worked in Vienna for four years, then in, Ger in Berlin for three, for, initially in Vienna for three years, then in Berlin for four. Now I've been one more year in Vienna, so it's in eight years I've been working in German. So I don't feel disadvantaged in using German. You can Deutsch sprechen wie, wie, wie andere Leute Deutsch sprechen, und das ist für mich überhaupt kein Problem. Uh, but I came to realize that there is a real disadvantage involved because if I have used German for eight years, and I feel quite fluent in it, but Germans or Austrians have used it for 40 or 50 years. And eight, eight years is not the same as 40 or 50. And in the same way, if there were to be a competition, say for a job in Brussels, and the competition were held in German, then I would certainly be disadvantaged vis-a-vis -vis German or Austrian colleagues. In the same way, most of you are fluent in English, and understand it very well, speak it very fluently. But if it's not your native language, then there is a difference between your level of English and the level of a native speaker. If you don't believe this, then how many of you, or say Slovaks or Poles, how many foreigners do you know who speak Slovak and write Slovak, as well as Slovaks do themselves? Not very many, I would say. How many foreigners learn Polish so well that they write, read and write Polish, as well as the good Polish authors? There's always a, an extra layer to be added. We can learn a lot in languages, but I find we have a lot more to, to learn as well, and this, this fact is often over, over, overlooked. Passing on quickly, uh, the time is, is, is passing by. One of the reasons I think that um, um, you, you have uh, a lot of problems, not just uh, linguistic problems, but problems in conflict in the world is the, the Scottish uh, writer, Esperanto writer, William Auld, uh, wrote a, a long poem called Infana Rasso, and the basic idea of this poem which has been published now in English and Scots Gaelic and Polish and uh, Dutch and Portuguese versions. It, it's been translated, it's a, an original poem in Esperanto, but it's been published in a lot of different languages in, in translation. But the real, the central idea is that the, the human race is at the level of a two-year-old child. Most of you have, who have brought up children, you know a two-year-old child, it's me, me, me. It's, he can see his own interests or her own interests, but nobody else's interests. And, I remember my, my daughter, my um, sister has, has twins and we visited her at Christmas when our, her children were two and they were simply, you couldn't speak to them, they, could, they would grab hold of a book and they would lose it somewhere and you, you couldn't find it afterwards, so it was always a problem. And then one year later we visited again and there were three. Now you could speak to them and you could say, uh, by all means look at this book but can you bring it back afterwards and they'd understand and they'd bring it back and everything worked. So the, the huge evolution that took place in, in children between the age of two and the age of three, the point by William Auld in his poem is that the human race is stuck at age two from the political point of view. That's why we need nuclear weapons. People feel that we need nuclear weapons to deter the other way. If we give up our nuclear weapons, the other guy will fire nuclear missiles at us. They, they understand their own self-interest, national self-interest, egotism, but they can't understand that you need to consider the, the interests of the other person, of the other country, of the other people as well. And that this, uh, um, this leap of the imagination that the children do from the age two to three has not yet been done by the human race. We're stuck in this uh, two-year-old, this infanitza peri period um, of this. And I put the final point I would mention is that Jean Monnet, one of the founding fathers of the European Union, he started at, from the economy, he started from coal and steel community, he's noticed that the Second World War took place because of uh, war between France and Germany, and uh, his idea was that by tying coal and steel together so much that it would make war impossible between France and Germany, this would be the beginning of European Union, and you could add to it uh, little by little in concrete achievements, not in one grand vision, but concrete achievements. But Years later, he, he mentioned, and I think one important phrase, he said that uh, if you were starting again, he would start from culture rather than from the economy, because culture affects uh, people more instinctively. Language and culture affects all of us. The economy affects us to an extent when I mean, we have to, to buy and sell, whereas language, we, we, from the time we wake in the morning, we're thinking in some language. We were singing, uh, we're listening to songs. It, it's more pervasive and more... more um, 
more um, all-encompassing. Um, so the whole idea of, of uh, aiming towards a European identity in harmony with national and regional identities uh, and looking at the idea of different identities, different levels of identity and uh, different languages to express that you can speak your own dialect, expressing your own local identity, your own city identity, a national language expressing a national identity, uh, another language expressing a European identity such as uh, um, which is a neutral language like Esperanto, but uh, none of them would be exclusive. And the fact that uh, Esperanto is used in Europe uh, would not exclude its use in China or Japan. In fact, it's more used, I would say, in China and Japan at the moment than it is in Europe. The fact that uh, America, that English is centered in the United States, doesn't in any way uh, hinder the learning of English throughout the world. The fact that it's uh, an American-centered language now with 300 million native speakers in the United States and in the same way for, for other languages. So I think I would conclude on, uh, on this. The, the quotation a few days ago from Angela Merkel, she said that the, the Europäer müssen ihr Schicksal in die, eigene Hand, in die eigene Hand nehmen und selbst für ihre Zukunft kämpfen. I think that that could be a positive direct effect of Brexit, that Europe begins to see that it has to work out its own future and that it cannot, certainly with the, the Trump presidency, I won't go into any details on that one, but it may not be as dependable as it was in the past to depend on the, the transatlantic um, alliance. So I would thank you for your attention. I think we still have some time for questions and, and comments. Uh, thank you. Hello. Thank you very much for that talk. It was extremely interesting, especially for me, because I work as a freelance simultaneous interpreter for the European Union. There are two consequences I see of Brexit. One you alluded to is the loss of quality, of the quality of the English language. We already suffer um, quite harshly from the use of what we call globish. Poor English being spoken throughout the European community. Uh, English has become the lingua franca. Uh, it's spoken at a sort of intermediate level. The richness of vocabulary gets lost, mainly upheld by the British, uh, and by, by the Southern Irish, Northern Irish, Southern Irish, <laughs> and the rest of the, of the UK. Okay, that's one consequence which we sort of fear, and it's going to get worse. Terrible. The second consequence, and I've, I've often heard it mentioned, but I can't really uh, say it's 100% true, is the cost of interpretation is usually borne by the countries for their own language. Now, with England exiting, the UK exiting, who is going to bear the cost of English? Because apparently everybody else is free riding on what, what the UK is paying for. So the Slovaks, for example, don't very often get interpretation into their own language. They will use English or they will use German. But when they use English, somebody else is paying for it, the UK. So apparently everybody else will have to bear the cost that's currently being borne by the UK. And some countries are already saying, no, no, we're just paying for our own lang language. We don't need English anymore, <laughs> you know. Somebody's going to foot the bill and we will not be able to, to make do without English, that's for sure. English will be used as a lingua franca, just like you said. But the question is, who is going to bear the costs for that? Probably everybody. Now, I don't know who pays for the interpretation because all, all the documents, even when they're still in a working stage, they're always being translated into English first and then maybe in some other languages and often just the latter versions or the final versions. So I don't know whether the uh, translating situation is the same as the cost situation in interpreting. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, I will speak in Esperanto because I'm not a native English speaker. Do saluto un kai dagon provia parolo. Uh, mi persona agas por teo por uh, po kiel extera representanto do mi om consias pri lingua politico uh, mi volas danke vin pro via presento mi nun havas demandon um, char estas tiel ke oni parolos ke vi mensis ke francio iam estis uh, havis grandan potencon ka franca estis la lingua franca ka nun estas la angla, ka nun oni opinias ke venos alia lingua, mi ne stias eble germana o hispana, do, ciu vi havas komentan pre tio, do, se ne estas esperanto, ciar la ferosos ke kiel anko ximin sis, ke iu devas pagia la costoin de la trodokado. Dankon.
Okay, and thank you very much for your point. Three, three, if we, uh, a third point, then we could take three together. Does it require an answer? Is there th another point oh, or another question? You. Okay, so, uh, not being European, I had a look at uh, official languages in the European Union, and I see that uh, all of the languages of the member states are official, and then there are some semi-official languages, which are sort of regional languages, but I just, being a bit of a troublemaker, that doesn't include Russian. And there are probably more speakers of Russian uh, than there are speakers of Welsh, for example. And then you have minority languages where we finally find Russian. So my question is, this designation of the status, is it purely a political thing determined by the member states themselves, or does the European Union take a position? And if in the future Ukraine were to join the European Union, where half the population has, has Russian as a native language, but where the government is very much against giving Russian any official status, would the European Union take an independent position with regard to the status of Russia? So a bit of a nasty question. Thank you very much for, for, for those three questions. Uh, just uh, look, uh, taking them in, in order. The first one about who pays, uh, I think it's to be worked out. Basically, it's uh, like Brexit is uh, unprecedented. It's the first time that a country which was a member of the European Union for 44 years decides to leave. So it's all up for negotiation and, and um, all the, the various details. They, it, there's a huge amount of question marks um, at the moment, but I, I, I think. Uh, because of English being used as a lingua franca, it, it won't disappear and some kind of solution will be found. But my hope would be that it will increase the discussion uh, on language policy. Thank you for Provia Demando said me, Vashaina ne respondus in Esperanto, Chamini, Sierchu, Chiwi, Comprendus Esperanto. I won't reply in Esperanto to the question in Esperanto I, I, because I'm not sure that everybody here understands Esperanto. But uh, just to the point was um, uh, that. Um, Will there be more? Will some other language take the place of English? Would German or French uh, be, be? Some countries would, would have the ambition. So that's absolutely true. I've, I've read this that some French speakers would like to see French uh, coming back to a dominant position, and some German speakers would say uh, German is spoken by nearly 100 million people in Europe and, and uh, should be the dominant language in, in Europe. And, and uh, I, I hope, I don't see this actually happening, but I think uh, hopefully. Putting all this together, you'll have at least more of a debate about language policy. And the more debate you have about language policy, the better the chance that people will look at a possible role for a language like Esperanto, which is much more easy to learn and which preserves the, the equality of, of, of languages. We, um, we have, for instance, the European anthem, which, as you know, it's uh, Beethoven's ninth. It's the, just the music was made the official language of uh, the official anthem of Europe by the heads of state and government in 1985. They deliberately didn't uh, select the words, the Andy Freude, the, the Ode to Joy, because the, the Andy Freude was written in German, first of all, and if they selected the words, it would be like declaring German as the first language of the European Union, because the words, it was the original language of the words. So they selected only the music, but not the words. And then at Esperanto gatherings, we have our own version of this, which we, we sing, which was written by an Italian Esperanto speaker, Umberto Brocatelli, which has to do with kind of leaving war behind us and peaceful, uh, harmonious uh, future in, in Europe. It's kind of, kind of sentiments that very few people would, would object to. And we have this in Esperanto, which we sing together in Esperanto. And at one stage, we had a meeting with the president of the European Parliament, uh, Jerzy Buzek, uh, former president, uh, former prime minister of Poland. And um, we gave him books about Esperanto. We didn't have that much interest in Esperanto, but when we mentioned to him that we have a version of the European anthem in Esperanto that we all sing, <laughs> sing together when we come from different countries, he showed interest right away. He said, ah, he said, that's a, practical, that's a practical value because in the European Parliament, we often play the European anthem, but there's always the problem as to which language should we sing in. If everybody sings in their own language, then it sounds like a, a cat's concert. It sounds pretty awful because they're all singing different words. But if we all sing in English, or we all sing in French, or we all sing in German, it's putting one language ahead of all the other national languages. Uh, therefore, 
um, that should be avoided. But he said immediately, um, an Esperanto version or a Latin version, uh, uh, singing it in a neutral language is, is perfect because then we can all sing together on the one hand, but on the other hand, we are also preserving the equality, equal validity of all the official languages uh, and cultures in the European Union. So he said that's a very elegant uh, solution indeed. So then we, we sent out the text in Esperanto uh, by email around Europe and within a few weeks we had versions, we had translations into 40 languages, into all of the official EU languages from Slovak and Slovene to, to, uh, to the to the smaller languages like Basque and Gallego and, and, and Galician uh, and uh, Catalan and uh, Welsh and Scottish Gaelic and uh, uh, Luxembourgish, all of those languages, plus even the major world languages outside the European Union, world languages like Russian, Chinese, Mandarin Chinese, uh, uh, the uh, Bengali, Hindi, um, Arabic, all of the other languages outside of Europe as well, and all of this, the cost of getting these translations uh, Zero. We simply sent it out to Esperanto speakers around the world. Back came the translations. Total cost, zero. So zero, zero cost. These things can work without costing any money on occasions. Uh, the, the question about Russian not being uh, official, that's absolutely true. There are more Russian speakers within the Union than there are speakers of many of the um, semi-official languages, certainly. Uh, Catalan, for instance, has, has uh, seven, eight, nine million speakers, and uh, because it's it's not an independent state, it has a, a semi-official status in the European Union. Uh, it's, it's, um, uh, but um, basically, it's the national governments which, which decide at the moment. It's, it's not the European Union. It's each government that decides which are the official languages. And uh, for instance, uh, the, the UK government asked for a semi-official status for Welsh and Scottish Gaelic. It meant that ministers, UK ministers at council ministers meetings in Brussels could speak in Welsh or Scottish Gaelic, and that has happened on occasion, if they happen to be speakers of Welsh or Scottish Gaelic, but they must bring along their own interpreters and pay for their own interpreters, that they're not paid for by the European Union. And in, in, in those occasions, that, that's the difference. And the same for, for Catalan, a Spanish speaker can, can speak in Catalan, but he has to bring his own interpreter and pay for his own in, interpreter at the, at the moment. At the, the present, the, the political decision, I mean, the Baltic states have not asked for any official status for Russian. Uh, we feel the same would be true of Ukraine uh, because of the political situation. It, even though Russian is spoken by quite a, a sizable percentage of, I think, well, well over 10 percent, if not more, probably over 10 million in the east of uh, Ukraine. But uh, the leadership in Kiev, the Ukrainian government, I, I spoke to some young Ukrainians on one occasion who spoke from Kiev, who spoke only Russian at home with their parents. They were just Russian speakers, and I asked them, would they like to see Russian having a co-official co status in, the Ukraine, in Ukraine? They said, no, absolutely not. Even as Russian speakers, they said they were completely against uh, official status for, for Russian. They said, because of national unity in Ukraine, the national language should be Ukrainian only. And I was really amazed to see this from native speakers of Russian, that they didn't want any status for their own language in their own country, but they wanted Ukrainian only. And it, it, it's an unusual attitude and, and probably explains some of the problems in, in, in Ukraine as well. That it's better to recognize the, the, the rights of all the speakers of all native, literally spoken languages in a country rather than say, well, we don't like this language and therefore we ignore the speakers of this language, whatever that language happens to, to, to be. Probably I've spoken too, too long already on that. Uh, do we have any more time? I think we're right on one minute. Any, any more questions? Or, or yes. yes, sorry. Thank you. You mentioned that the uh, UK is benefiting from the dominance of the English language. Uh, and this can be described financially. Could you explain that how? Because I cannot imagine. Yes, it's actually, I was quoting from Professor uh, uh, François Grain. He's published a report on this. It's on the internet. It's about 130 pages. He's, he's, very, he's an economist and he, he mentions things like uh, hundreds of thousands of people come to the UK and to Ireland to learn English. Uh, there's no inflow of people, say, to Slovakia to, to learn so Slovak in the same way. Uh, textbooks, the production of uh, films and textbooks and 
various, uh, he, he's added it all up in the, this, it's quite a detailed report, but uh, it comes to, to a lot of, of extra money. The, the amount of extra time involved as well, that the amount of time spent in other countries learning English, whereas native English speakers can decide. In fact, the UK government decided in 2002 that 14-year-old um, children in school no longer had to learn any foreign language. They, they were allowed to simply drop the study of a foreign language. So that means that the, the time that other non-English speakers have to spend learning English, the native English speakers can spend learning science or learning music or learning something else. So it's, a, it's another advantage there. But I won't go into the details because it's a long report. It's about 130 pages. But if you Google uh, François Grand and the report, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's in French and originally, but I think there are translations in some other languages at least, and you can find it on the, on the internet. So, uh, th th thank you very much for your attention. Multan Dankon Prola Atento.